Cultic. Controlling. Manipulative. Deceptive. No other words can describe the Harvest House. This organization was founded in 1997 as a place of hope, healing, and restoration. In the last several years, things have gone horribly wrong. A convicted child abuser in authority. Staff sexually harassing vulnerable young women with the founder covering it all up. The homeless deliberately poisoned. Donations gone missing. These are just some of the many issues surrounding the Harvest House. Former staff and volunteers have banded together and are speaking out. One long-term former staff member stated, Yes, there's a good work being done by a few, but I could probably name thousands that have been there with a heart for the broken and have been driven out and shamed. In my 20-year affiliation, I have never heard the Harvest House or any of its employees apologize for anything. Never an admittance of wrongdoing. Only a scramble to pull ranks and attempt to get their story straight and cover up. We recently met with the founder, Cal, and a board member for a two-hour in-person meeting. What we learned was horrendous. The founder acknowledged some of the allegations yet justified his staff members. In fact, he even stated point-blank that he would hire pedophiles under certain conditions. While acknowledging sexual harassment among his staff and while acknowledging that he covered it up for a year so that no one would know about it, rather than apologize, he justified his actions as though his actions were normative behavior. He further blamed the victims and at times called them liars, even in the face of facts. In short, it was a meeting which revealed to us the depth of corruption that the Harvest House is entrenched in. While the founder speaks of love and forgiveness in public, he was malicious in our face-to-face -face meeting, digging his heels in and arrogantly proclaiming the innocence of the Harvest House regarding each and every claim made against it. They've changed their stories and moved staff around in effort to avoid accountability. They've banded religious support together. Pastors and leaders across the city have continued to affirm the Harvest House even in the midst of the revelations we're about to show you. The public, however, has shown great support and we thank you for that. Our goal is to seek justice for the victims and provide a voice for those whom the Harvest House has shamed into silence. They've successfully stopped others in the past, but that ends now and it ends permanently with the release of this film exposing the utter depravity of an organization which long ago lost its way. Without further ado, we present to you The Other Side, an investigative documentary on the Harvest House. Amanda Northrup and I arrived at Harvest House in 2003 due to homelessness. My name is Amanda and I hold multiple roles with the Harvest House. Um, I was a shelter assistant, so I worked in an overnight shelter. Um, I was volunteer coordinator at one point. I worked for them three times over the last 10 years. Um, I was drop-in manager and most recently I was shelter assistant and volunteer coordinator. I came to the Harvest House uh, about 14 years ago, and I came down because my fiancé had come to the recovery program, which was relatively new at that time, um, and I came down the summer that, that he was in there, 
Um, I had been there you know, previously and I just really, really was, um, you know, like drawn to the community factor of it and, you know, what they were doing and they were helping the homeless and, and you know, like drug addicted. Um, I'm a recovering addict myself. Um, I've, I've had a very, you know, hectic life and I really wanted to be a part. So with my fiance in the program, I decided that I wanted to come down and volunteer for the summer. And uh, I just fell in love with the community and never left. Uh, what brought me to Harvest House was uh, I, I was homeless and a friend of mine uh, from my neighborhood had run into me and told me he knew of a place that had rooms for rent for women in need. Uh, so I showed up. Uh, it was a Sunday and there was church happening. Uh, so I stayed for church and then I was introduced to a bunch of people in ministry um, and then they brought me to this rooming house uh, in which I rented a room for 250 bucks a month at that point on the corner of Gordon and Cameron. What brought me to the home, point of homelessness uh, is my mom passed away um, and we didn't have a whole lot of family. My grandfather lived too far away, she, we didn't have money. Um, I was in the foster care system until I was 18. When I turned 18, they let me go and handed me a welfare check. Uh, my mom, who was also on welfare, uh, couldn't support me. And, and then when she passed, I really had no other option. Uh, and then I found Harvest House on High Street. <laughs> so when I first came to Harvest House, it was a close-knit family, both staff and community. We didn't have much as a community. Um, back then there was no paid staff. Um, we were all volunteers and it was, it was something I had never experienced before in my life. And it was something that was just, it was fulfilling and happy. And you know, it was, it was community. My experience with leadership in 2003 was amazing. I believe when God was still there, I felt amazing. I felt like these people cared. It was a warm hug. Uh, I felt great. Um, we were close. It was family. It was, you know, we went to each other's houses. We had barbecues. We had picnics. We did things together. And then I went back after leaving, after being gay for longer, <laughs> um, after coming back with my tail between my legs, I came back and they were all gone. Gerald had passed away. Cliff has passed away. I'm sure they scared a few away. And there was all these new people and they had no idea. That tight knitted family feel um, began to slip through the cracks and it, you know, it became more corporate like, I guess. There was no more, you know, just kind of popping in and saying hi. Um, you know, you couldn't just walk in and, and sit down and do a Bible study. It now has to be scheduled. Um, you could have someone who donates 20 hours a week to, you know, the organization and if the doors are locked, they're not even allowed in. Um, so it's, um, and I mean, not always, unfortunately, it seems to be selective because there are favorites now. There never were, um, back years ago. Um, and it, in my opinion, from my experience, from what I've seen from 14 years ago to now, I see it being more about money and more about public relations than it is about really helping the people. Um, you know, when you have somebody who comes in and it's raining and they have soaking wet feet and they need a pair of socks and we have a clothing room that's got socks and we turn them away because, oh, it's not open right now. That's not what I signed up for when I first came years ago because those people have to go back out in the rain with those wet feet and we have socks in the room, but it's closed. So that's a big change. Um, a lot of people who work there will um, excuse it. I was one of them because it's it's very cult-like. Um, you, if if you don't conform and follow the rules, you're reprimanded, and and it's almost as though you're ostracized in a sense until you do conform. And 
I'm not one who conforms easily. So um, I was getting myself reprimanded often because I would open the door and get socks. Um, if people were barred, I would feed them. And then I would be taken in and talked to because you can't feed these people. They're barred from the property. It changed when Cliff and Gerald died. I think it may have turned into something different. The heart wasn't there anymore. And unfortunately, it took me getting away from my family. Sorry, it's kind of emotional. It really is. It took me leaving my family, coming an hour and a half away, for me to do anything with myself. Because there's no other shelter in Moncton right now. You're either House of Nazareth, which is a beautiful spot too, um, you're either there, or you're at Harvest House. They took Tent City, I'd love to go back there. That was the best home ever. And my friends were there, my family. The leadership changed from loving individuals, people who had a heart for people, to, you know, frustrated and, you know, because it's a demanding job. So the frustration builds up and the leadership just started being bosses and, you know, oftentimes just kind of power tripping. Um, not kind of, definitely power tripping. When I remember a day that we could knock on each other's doors any time of night. I remember a day when, you know, someone would come to shelter four o'clock in the morning. We opened the door and we let them in and we drug mattresses in from a shed that we had out back and we gave them a coffee and we gave them something to eat because they were cold and they were hungry and they were tired and that doesn't happen anymore. Oh no, you can't come in. So leadership's no longer leadership in, in a sense that a ministry should be. I don't even like saying ill about them because the point is there, but they're going about it the wrong way. And since they've gotten all this extra funding from places, the heart's gone but the BMWs are parked in the driveway and the big fancy suburban trucks and they don't hide it. You think they could be humble enough to park it down the road instead of showing obviously where the Harvest House money is going. Ever since the board of directors came and Cal lost his job and he became the pretty face for Harvest House, that's when things changed. That's when it's no longer home. Uh, my name is Amanda Dirksen, and I did a practicum for the Harvest House through my schooling from April 15th till June 7th. My name is Ashley Perry. Uh, my affiliation would be, I just stayed there. I never worked there, I never volunteered there, anything other than that. I slept there when I had to. I, I stayed at the Harvest House for six months, that was the longest, but I've stayed there off and on for the last like 10 years probably. The positive experiences I've had at the Harvest House was getting to know the people that were using the facilities. Some of the positive experiences I had at the Harvest House were with the other people staying there more than anything. I, my best friends I've met at the Harvest House for the most part. I've experienced uh, Boundaries being crossed at the Harvest House. Uh, James Geldart, he would uh, give me hugs, and I would have to squeeze the back of his arm to get me in, to to get him to let me go. Um, he'd also like slide his hands down through his hugs. There, there has been you know like a staff member there who um, it's very inappropriate when it comes to uh, you know sexual in indiscrepancies and, uh, you know, things like really long hugs and, you know, inappropriate conversation at times and, um, and not just with staff, because again, I'm a strong personality. It didn't happen too often with me because I set it in place. Um, but it happened a lot, a lot with, with the clients, unfortunately. The, the night staff, there's this James guy on a personal level. Talking to him, I've never had a problem with him. He's a little goofy, you know what I mean? He, um, you could tell that he's got some problems up in the head. Um, but on a personal level, he's never, he's never struck me uh, anything but a nice, goofy person. 
but uh, I've slept there and I was upstairs and he is a pervert and he does things to women and he 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 antagonizes and he 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 uh, flirts to with, with with almost every girl that is up there and if you give him a chance to allow allow him to give you a hug or something that's what he does he gropes he he holds he he touches and i hear this from everybody he is handsy with all of the girls well most of the girls at the harvest house like it's it's ridiculous and i've experienced that as well but since then he's stopped james geldart number one example likes to hug all the women to the point i've heard susan mcdonnell I've heard Susan tell him he cannot hug people anymore because people are starting to talk. Straight from Susan's mouth to James in the doorway of the kitchen. I was sitting at the chair next to the exit door and she said, you have to stop hugging people. People are talking. I was warned by Sue McDonald and Cal Maskery, Rose Maskery and Jamie Mills to about how James has tendencies to cross boundaries. Um, and they told me to like stay away from him. But at the same time, they would get me to go for rides with him because he was not allowed. Uh, he wasn't allowed in the donation room by himself with any females. He was not allowed in anywhere by himself with any females. Um, so I would go for drives when he would have to take someone like to the RCMP station or to the hospital. After that, James would come to me five feet away until he's touching me, my body. I cannot hug me, hug you, hug me first. How are you? So I'd hug him, cause he's creepy. You hug him to get him off of your breast and he walks away. I heard Susan tell him he can't hug people anymore and he came up and said, I'm not allowed to hug you, hug me. How are you doing? Word for word, he did this for six weeks until I left Harvest House and moved for eight months. At the end of my time there, James Gelder had given me a card and flowers. And in the card it had said, I don't remember the whole card, but in the beginning, I had stopped actually in the reading from the beginning. It had said, uh, I never knew what was gonna happen between us. I didn't expect this to be like this. So I got really uncomfortable. I found him with another staff in the chapel and I brought the card and I said, James, we need to talk about this card and, and what it means. And he's like, oh, let's talk over here. Let's talk over here. And I said, no, 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 no. We, we can talk right here. It's okay. The, I, I trust the volunteer that's here. Um, and he had said, well, you just changed my, my views of women and this and that. And I was like, hey, James, like friends only, you know, like I told you. <laughs> I've told him frequently, friends only, bud. Um, I also found him in places that like all of a sudden he was where I was at. Like when I would go to my meetings at my school, all of a sudden he's there. Um, I actually spoke to a woman who came to me about a year ago. She came to me with her cell phone, showed me messages from one, well, this individual, that this individual was waiting for her at a hotel room. I saw the text message. I read it. Um, I called one of the leaders and informed him. Um, he then went to uh, like the director's wife and brought this, tried to bring this to light apparently. Um, this was on a Saturday, the following Tuesday in the staff meeting, um, the director's wife stood up and said, you know, there are rumors about this man going around and um, the person who started these rumors totally made them up and uh, you need to not put any weight on this. I saw the text message. This woman I haven't seen since. James Gildert was being inappropriate with guests, my friend. I went to Sue McDonnell. I brought it to her attention and she told me to wait. And then I told her what James was doing and she still told me to wait. And then she's like, I'll have a chat with James when I'm done here. And it was like, the next day they had a chat with James. And uh, really it's not, it's not fair to these, uh, these girls that have to go there and put their, put their trust in a staff that when they're taking a shower is peeking in on them. Stuff like that. 
Um, every time he walks past the bathroom to go get towels and go to the thing, he's looking in the bathroom. And there's people that are catching him do this and put him, put him on this. And he doesn't deny it. And, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the organization allows him to do this. This is the problem. They have been told. They know. They know about this. Sue McDonnell came to the Harvest House about a year and a half ago. I was only a volunteer once a week at the time. Um, her and her husband were coming up and they were volunteering. Um, she very quickly immersed herself into a role and she was working in shelter. Um, I, at this point, um, had left my previous job and I had gotten a hold of you know, the leadership at Harvest House and asked, um, are you like, are you looking for any shelter staff? Because I go through these, I miss helping people when I'm not helping people. Right. So it was Sue at that time who was the manager. She was, you know, promoted at this point. Um, so I had to go and interview with her. Um, she was very excited to bring me back on the team because she had heard, you know, like about me. Um, my husband at the time also worked for the, you know, ministry. And, um, so I was, I was known and they knew that I loved the people. Um, she, she was also warned that I was a bit of a difficult personality. So, you know, that was like, there were some restrictions put down. So, you know, um, she just made sure that she had told me, so you answer to me. Um, you only answer to me. Um, you're not to go to Cal. You're not to go to Jamie Mills. You're not to go, you know, I only answer to her. Um, that was basically, um, there were issues over the years where staff would go over their, their manager's head and it would just create chaos. So that I understood, right? Sue was in charge of getting the paperwork to the appropriate places so that people could continue on with their medical recovery, medications and so, and such. Um, to uh, any staff, if uh, if myself, as an example, went in and I was needing something, um, a pair of gloves because it was too cold outside, a uh, uh, raincoat because it was raining outside. Um, we were made to stay outside of the building uh, all day long. Um, didn't matter what kind of elements it was outside. Uh, it was highly unlikely that they would allow you indoors unless we had torrential rains. Um, so snowstorm, light drizzles, rain, um, unless it was torrential, um, like the one we just had. Um, any other time we were made to stay outside. Uh, so let's say I would needed a raincoat because I was out in the elements and I knew that in the clothing store, the, door, the clothing room, that there was a raincoat in there then I would ask a staff member for a raincoat. Well, that staff member was made to go to Sue because oh, Sue overseen everything. She was the boss. Um, and when I first met her, I didn't mind her um, because she seemed at the time to really be there for the right reasons. Um, she came on. Um, I knew that she wasn't taking a salary. And to me, if you're going to put your time 40, 50, 60 hours a week and not take a pay, then your heart has to be in the right place. Then I got to know her. Um, uh, she was one of the worst managers I have ever worked under in my career in anything, let alone at the Harvest House. Um, so I was sitting home one day and uh, discovered that um, she had a very compromising past, I guess you could call it. Um, when I found the news articles that she had um, almost killed her foster daughter, her, well, she was adopted actually, they were foster parents, her and her husband in Nova Scotia, and she was actually charged, um, convicted, pled guilty. Um, she had suffered from a disorder that the news called fic fictitious disorder with proxy. So of course I researched because this is my boss, right? So I researched the disorder and I researched her past and it was very confusing for me because I'm trying to look at it from a Christian perspective 
and a forgiving perspective, but at the same time, you know, try to be wise about the whole thing because I was getting, um, as I got to know her, I, I like, I saw signs of, of, you know, like the disorder, the, the hero complex that they have, um, which comes with the disorder. And, you know, there were times that you would just see, she would just be mean and, you know, her, she was getting frustrated. She was putting a lot of hours in and the frustration was coming out. And with that disorder, that's not a good thing because it can trigger it. Um, and this isn't me. This is, I've looked this up. Anyone who Googles a disorder or looks it up or talks to a doctor will confirm it. There are certain signs you look for. And those people should never be put in a position over vulnerable people, not because she's a bad person, but because it's the same thing as putting a mentally ill person in charge of vulnerable, mentally ill people. Um, I'm a recovered drug addict. You're not going to put me working at a pharmacy with opiates. It's a bad idea. You don't put a recovered pedophile, even though he's been saved and, you know, Jesus and we forgive him. You still use wisdom. You don't put your sin and your, your weaknesses in front of you. Um, that's not how we get strong. Like even in our first or even in our first experience of being at the Harvest House, I was pregnant. And Sue McDonald's way of dealing with, there was nothing to deal with. I just needed a flipping doctor's appointment. I didn't need her to try to rearrange my entire life. I needed the doctor's appointment because I was even worried. And as it turned out, I miscarried. That's something that, that I'll live with, but I will never be able to live with the fact that this woman was trying to, she told me that you should go to Crossroads and leave Chris to fend for himself on the street. I don't ever remember having a conversation with her telling her, you know what, I really need to get away from Chris. I don't think this is the best for me. That conversation, nothing like that ever took place. So I just didn't understand. And then I find out what Sue Max and Hell is all about. My word. The child I lost or the children I have and the grandchildren I have, they've never been subjected to anything so malicious. This is a woman who I thought was so friendly. You know, she just seemed to be like, hi, how are you? Good morning. You know, and, and sometimes those things are reoccur encouraging and motivating to get your day going, right? And then to find out what she's, what she's really about and she picks and chooses who's part of her clique. They were there to help me. They understood my care for my son. They were gonna fight to help me get my son back when she tried to kill her foster children. And it is very much in the news that she did it. She got her job at Harvest House before she was released from Nova Institution. And the fact that she has that job with child protection background and a criminal record is absolutely obscene. And I finally, I couldn't work under her anymore. <laughs> I couldn't. Um, and then it went viral. Um, um, it got out. It got out on Moncton News Chasers. It got out all over social media. It got all through the, the community. Um, so Harvest House, and I was still working there at the time, they made the decision to move her up to the office. We're supposed to have people that are background checked so we're comfortable having our children there. We're supposed to have people that are... What's the word? Recovered? Uh, people that learned from their life experiences. And I don't believe that she did. I went through a, a you know, criminal record check. You are not supposed to be working overnight in, in the shelter there if you have a criminal record. Um, and considering her charges and her history, putting her overnight shelter and whether you're desperate or not, there's lots of volunteers who would go up there and work. Um, or one of your paid staff. She needs help and uh, jail and Jesus might be her help, but she should not be in control or in any kind of authority figure over a human being or even an animal at that. That bothers me a lot. She doesn't put people's um, papers through. That happened three times just in the last couple days there. I've seen people's paperwork not being put in. I talked to a social worker on the phone with a man I personally brought to Sue's office because his paperwork hadn't put, been put through the month before and he didn't get his check. 
So, and he was scared. He pulled me aside actually and asked me if it was because he was gay that he wasn't getting the services that he needed. And I said, honestly, buddy, like <laughs> I'm starting to see all kinds of stuff here. That's a very good possibility. You're not getting the services because of your identity. And, uh, so the, he didn't get his check again that time. And the social worker was like, we did not receive the paperwork. And I said, I literally saw her do it with him. You know, like he did his paperwork, his uh, POR or whatever that they do. And that happened a few times with people, you know, saying them saying that uh, they didn't get their paperwork put through, like, where's my check? And they were all hopeful and they didn't get their services. Um, then a lot of people didn't get their messages. I had all, different organizations getting angry because nobody, they couldn't get through to their clients. And, and I said to Sue one day, like, maybe you got too much on your plate, like, and you probably should have your own separate phone number other than the whole, the whole building phone number, right? Um, I was very unprofessional there, very, uh, the way Sue talked to people was terrible, like talking to them like they're little kids. And with Sue, I didn't know about her prior history. So my first meeting with Sue, because I also met with Sue before I started there, I thought, what is up with this lady? Like, where does she come from and what qualifies her to be in charge of all these people? So I went and I Googled her name to see what her credentials were. And the news report pops up that she was charged and convicted of starving out a foster baby. And I was like, whoa. I went to my instructor with this information and said, do you really feel I'm going to be a fit here? And she explained to me, Amanda, you're going to meet all kinds of people with different paths. Maybe you should look into what, you know, causes that. So I went home and I studied Munchausen by proxy. <laughs> I came to a bit of an understanding, yet it was not her child. She did it too. It was a foster child. So I still had some like, whoa. Um, she, and then when I confronted her about it after, because a lot of people disrespect her for that. A lot of people. It scratched into the bathroom doors constantly. They're painting. I have pictures of that. Yeah, Sue is a baby killer. What's she doing here? They, she has zero respect from people. You know, I said, you know, I kind of had a hard time with it too, Sue. I said, but I kind of researched it and stuff. She denied even that she had a mental illness and that uh, the devil was involved in this situation that happened. And I was like, okay. And I confronted Cal. I confronted Sue, Rose, all of them about my concerns. And... Cal told me that Sue asked the Lord for forgiveness and the Lord has forgiven her. So that is why she qualifies this for this position. She was trusted to take care of children and she tried to kill that child. What would she do to us? My name is Bob Rubel and I'm a preacher with the Church of Christ. Uh, do I have a vested interest in how I answer uh, in this matter? I have no uh, vested interest in the Harvest House. I don't know other than what I read about what they do uh, at the Harvest House. I have no uh, vested interest in the people that are making the documentary. I'm simply giving uh, what I understand about what the Bible teaches. Well, the first thing that comes to mind when I think about what the Bible uh, has to say about caring for the poor is uh, a verse in James where James says to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And it's interesting that he brought up those two uh, groups, widows and orphans, because in his day, those were the absolute destitute people they were starving to death literally and uh that was brought up uh as a as being the true religion that we should have because that true religion is going to be doing good for the poor without any hope of good things happening to you uh, whether it be financial gain whether it be praise from people uh whatever uh, you're simply doing it with no hope that they'll ever be able to return the favor. Now, in our day, 
uh, orphans and widows may not be the primary group. It may be the homeless, the destitute, the addicted. Those are the people that are really destitute in our world today. What does the Bible say about having spiritual authority over others? Uh, the Bible is very clear on that, that uh, from an, a number of points of view, uh, the warning, be not many of you teachers, because a special judgment is going to come upon you. So you have to be careful of that. Uh, uh, a warning uh, against uh, people who are false uh, in their pretenses. They pretend that they care for the poor, but they don't. Uh, these are all things that we have to be careful about. What should be our attitude in placing people in positions of leadership who have a past history uh, of child abuse or abuse, sexual abuse of any type? Uh, we have to be very careful with this. Now, make no mistake about it, a person can't be forgiven of their sins, but you don't put the person in a position where they are going to be tempted uh, or to fall back into their old ways. Uh, they have to be protected from themselves and people have to be protected from them. How should we react when uh, the churches are abusing the poor and this becomes comes out in the open? Uh, it has to be very open. Uh, as soon as a church is accused of this, the leaders need to make everything open to everyone uh, so that everyone can see how everything is being done. Uh, there should be, there's no room for doing things behind closed doors. What would I say to a group or a congregation who uh, wants to uh, block out disclosure or block out investigation into their uh, activities, I would say that that is a problem in itself, that they need to be very open about how they are conducting their ministry. Uh, that's the first step uh, to, uh, to uh, providing a, a, an open, honest service. Uh, have I uh, ever had any uh, first-hand knowledge of uh, how this was handled in churches? Uh, yes, uh, there was a, an elder that I'm aware of in a congregation that was accused of uh, saying things that were not right to a woman. And immediately uh, a meeting was held, the elder was there, the woman was there, the family was there, everything was very out in the open. As it turned out, the elder had done nothing wrong, uh, but everybody had to be there in order to uh, document that. There are some uh, definite ways that Christians uh, and as individuals or as a church can help the poor. Uh, and ideally, uh, the best way that they can help the poor is anonymously. Uh, if, if you or I uh, were to help the poor, we can simply make a donation. We don't have to tell anybody about it. We don't have to report it to on our income tax. We don't have to do anything. We simply help the poor out of a pure motive of love. My best friend, I walked in there, she was staying with me uh, at a, a, another location at a house for a couple of days and um, she was sick. Um, she had an abscess, a couple of them actually, and she thought she was being a burden on me. So she went and I found out that she was staying at Harvest House. Well. It had been 24 hours. I knew she was getting worse. I tried to get her to go to the hospital when she was staying with me at a at a house, and she just wouldn't. She just wouldn't go. She didn't want to go because she knew it would be painful. Uh, one morning, there was a girl like had come in, and she was very sick. She was clammy, pale, greenish, very, very sick. I had asked her to um, 
let me take her to the hospital because she was refusing ambulance services. She said, no, 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 I'll go later, I'll go later. So they tried to throw her out, but I snuck her back in and I laid her out on uh, these chairs and I had put a comforter on the bottom, laid her up, got her all cozy and kept checking up on her. Seeing her laying on three chairs at the back corner of the Harvest House, and when I looked down and seen Jamie Mills playing on his phone, <laughs> I went over to her. She was barely breathing. She was barely conscious. When it was throughout the morning, they have cameras upstairs in the offices. And one of the ladies, I believe, is a board of directors, Kathy. She had come downstairs and she had uh, asked me what, or sorry, I shouldn't say her name, uh, what this young woman was doing here. Why, she, why does she get to be inside? And I said, well, she's really sick. And she goes, well, maybe she needs a doctor. And I said, well, she's saying no. And Sue's refused me to call 911 because she's saying no. Um, she then told me that she feels that this is enabling and I had said, uh, if you send her back out there and she dies on the streets, that's on you. Well, I didn't even think she was alive. I, you could barely feel a pulse. And then it was time for shift change when I leave at four and the others come in. So Jamie Mills came on and there were two other guests that had pressured Jamie Mills to call 911. So eventually 911 was called for this girl. I lost it. I said, Jamie, what are you doing? I said, are you not checking on her? We're like, why the hell is she not in the bed? Well, she seemed okay a while ago. I said, yeah, and have you checked on her? His answer was, well, she seemed all right. I said, would you want to call a friggin' ambulance? Like now? And I told, I, I, I told her that, like, she, I'd go with her and I'd stay with her and, like, uh, man, I, like, uh, Jamie Mills and the rest of that staff, they should be ashamed of themselves. To have somebody almost near death, and I went with her to the hospital, and they had a team of 10 doctors and nurses. It took them... 15 minutes to be able to put IVs in. They had to put the IVs in her feet because her veins were so bad. Her palates were so low. She did end up being treated for endocarditis. She did die four times in the hospital over the course of a few weeks. And to think of what Harvest House, if I hadn't gone there at that time, she might have died in Harvest House alone with staff neglecting her well-being. Myself, it was more for personal care because when I was going through chemo, I was sick all of the time. And when I was staying there, they wouldn't even let me lay down in the room that nobody was staying in downstairs to sleep. They still made me go outside during the day. And this is the middle of the winter still. I'm, I have no hair. I'm sick from chemo treatments two days before and they still won't let me in even to sit down and be warm during the day they make me stay outside when i did decide to go to the harvest house i was sick with pneumonia and um there were there was a couple people uh in there like i said that were all nancy like we're gonna look after you da 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 right and uh they, a couple of the girls tried to get me uh, water to bring down my, my uh, t uh, fever. And uh, we asked for uh, water with ice cubes and that in it. And uh, we weren't allowed to have it. No was the answer. No, not da da da, just no. Uh, that night when uh, I went upstairs, uh, I couldn't even go in the room and lie down. I uh, I slept on the 
the washroom floor because it, it was cooler where I had the fever. And the guy was working that night. Uh, he came in the washroom with a great big bag of ice like that and said, there you go, Nancy. I went, oh, wow, man, thank you very much, right? Because uh, I was told from the higher up staff, no. So <laughs> that person that gave it to me, I think they just went and <laughs> grabbed it and hid it away and took it to me, right? So, uh, and I was, uh, one of the girls uh, asked if I could have a, have a blanket to cover up until we went upstairs. And uh, the staff that was working, like uh, every now and then I'll smoke pot, not very often, but uh, like I don't do the dope no more. So uh, she tried, I was lying over in the corner like I said, my fever was bad, and uh, she, this girl went and asked staff for a blanket to cover me. So uh, she couldn't even get a blanket to cover me. And uh, the remarks from the staff member said, well, maybe if she wasn't so fucking high on the dope and that, she wouldn't have a fever. Well, the girl come back and said, listen, Yes, I like my needles and I like my jib and that, but this girl here, no, no, man, she don't touch none of the dope. So that was uncalled for. But anyway, she got me covered up and that with coats and whatever. Uh, there was this gentleman that came from Saskatchewan and he had a tendency to drink rubbing alcohol. And we had previously called 911 for him, but this time, it was 9, 10 a.m. and he was inside the chapel and he was passed out. Uh, a, another guest had come to me and brought me the empty bottle of, of the uh, rubbing alcohol and said, I think he was drinking this again. So I brought it to Sue and I said, Sue, like, he's been drinking the alcohol again. Like, we got to get an ambulance. Where is he? I said, he's in chapel. Well, then she hummed and hawed because we didn't want to disrupt chapel. Then she made a justification that he was surrounded by people, he was still breathing, and that we could call 911 at 10 o'clock when chapel ended, which is exactly what happened. I felt guilty that night, I did. I felt really guilty. And the next day I went to see my teacher, and I, or like my instructor, and I told her about it. And she said, no, that's not right. And she came down with me to the Harvest House. She met me there and told Cal and Rose Amanda will be calling 911 when she needs to call 911, whether chapel's in session or not. So they agreed to that. And Sue was not there for the meeting because I had asked Sue not to be there in any of my meetings. And so the following week, I'm doing dishes and a guest comes up and says, Amanda, he's over on St. George and Cameron. And he's on the bench. He's been drinking the alcohol again. I said, okay, drop the dishes. I ran over to St. George and Cameron, called 911, waited for all that to happen, came back. And then I got um, criticized from Sue that I'm not a team player, that I shouldn't be leaving the property, that basically because he was off the property, it was not our problem. So then another time happened. Amanda, he's over on St. George and Dominion, on the corner of St. George and Dominion. I said, oh. So again, I went running out, called 911, and then I got reprimanded again for it. And she basically told me that had I not been a student, I would have not been, have lasted there for my actions. And that maybe I should look into being a, like a street worker, like a community outreach worker, and that would probably be better suited for me. Some other experience I had at the Harvest House while I stayed there. Um, I had uh, to pass in my medication. Any kind of medication you had to pass into the staff. So um, my medication is for chronic pain. And so uh, this, I gave it to the staff. So my first lot of pills, is gonna, I take them 
uh, between 4.30 and 5.30 in the morning. No half squats or box. I could be sleeping. I wake up because my pain wakes me up. So I, I was told by the staff members, do I have to say his name? Yes, I do. James, <laughs> that he wasn't going to be getting up between 4.30 and 5.30 for to give me my medication. So in the story, I was late having my medications. So my medications were uh, no more. They were empty. So when I went to the drugstore the next day or I didn't, I wasn't so honest. Instead of turning them in like I was supposed to do, I never done it. I hid them away in my sock because I, I got chronic pain. And if the staff is not going to give them to me, I keep them myself. Yeah, so far as I understand, uh, at the Harvest House, no, uh, no staff there that is working there part-time, full-time, as uh, any, uh, like any certificates of any kind to pass out medications to myself for chronic pain or people with mental illness. And when Charles left the George Dumont Hospital, he knew I was staying at the Harvest House and he many times stayed at my place in Moncton before I was evicted. So he didn't have any place else to go but to the Harvest House for a place to sleep. So Robin and her husband Charles, <clears throat> I had come and Charles was sick. He was in and out of the hospital. Uh, I remember just cringing because they would make him leave and it was cold outside and the man was like yellow. His eyes, like the white of his eyes were yellow. Um, and then I learned he had this heart condition going on and that he was basically, he was, he was dying. After leaving the George Dumont Hospital to get shelter for the night and as he knocked on the door, one of the staff went to the door and said that you're not welcome because you're not here before sign-in. They left him in the parking lot in the middle of the night and wouldn't allow him shelter. They turned their back on him in his need, in his time of great need. He passed on the 22nd of May. So in both the middle of May, I believe, I can't remember exactly when he did pass away. Um, Robin had a very hard time with that. Uh, she became very depressed. I mean, she lost her other half. Um, then somehow her paperwork, like others, got mixed up and she did not receive her white card. So she did not get her medications. So that made it even harder for her. Um, Sue and her made some kind of arrangements with her pharmacist to get these medications for the day, so daily until she did get her white card. Um, I said right away, like, I'll, I'll drive her. I'll, I'll drive her there. And then Sue pulled me aside and said, no, we're not going to be driving guests where they need to go. Um, she's quite capable of making it on her own. Um, it's not far. And by this time, I had given up being sneaky. Um, taking people on for rides or moving them out on my lunch break or waiting till four when I was done work. I just gave up and just started doing what I was going to do by then. So I took Robin to her pharmacist, which was not around the block. It was a far distance. It was, it was at least a 20 to 30 minute walk for her. Um, in my heart, I feel even if it was around the block, I'm still going to drive her. And I'm still going to have that talk with her, give her a hug, give her alone time, you know, maybe listen to a song that reminds you because music like helps me a lot. Uh, I've noticed it helps a lot of people in my car. They have their own playlist. Um, but yeah, I would have taken her no matter where. I would have walked with her. Whatever, whatever the case, she needed to be with somebody. Um, after that, Robin went missing. No, no one, not even her son knew where she went. Um, they refused to tell him. They refused to tell everybody where she went. So we kind of just didn't know. We didn't know where her dog went. We, I did know there were people that were willing to take her dog while she was away. Um, 
but then the dog just disappeared still to this day. We're not quite sure where Milo is, if he's been put down, if he's with this family they claim he's with, or did he go to the SPCA? We're not sure. Um, she also still hasn't received her personal items that she's been asking for since she's been out of the hospital, along with several others that I know have not received their personal items, which I believe are all in the garbage because that's where they put people's personal items is right in the garbage. When donations would come in, uh, we'd bring the bags into the donation room and it's locked. Um, so I, I personally would bring in bags. There were still tags on some of these things. There was like Nike shoes, there like some really good stuff, really good clothing. Um, people in this community are very generous. Um, but then it wouldn't be there. So then I started watching. And when chapel would end, these church ladies would come in and they would bag up the clothes and they would leave with six to eight bags of clothes. And I started catching on. Uh, one day after it had completely stormed and I woke up face down in a puddle, frozen, I went in and asked for a pair of socks. And their answer to me was, we don't have any. So I wrapped two t-shirts around my feet, walked to Salvis, and managed to get six pairs of socks. But how does a homeless shelter not carry socks? Well, it could be because of the fact that, gee, I don't know, the donations that are going in there for clothing, you have a bunch of little ladies walking out with bags full. Is that where the socks are going? I don't know. And I was like, what's going on here? So then I started getting nosy. I said, well, where are you guys bringing all this stuff? And they said, community living. And I said, but didn't the community, or isn't they under the assumption that this is going to the homeless? And they said, well, actually, we're only giving away the stuff that we can't use. I'm like, six to eight bags of clothes, you can't use that? And then I kind of just got sloughed away. So then I started telling the church ladies, oh, I'll help you with that. And I would take the bags and I'd look and it was the like stuff that was brought in. And I'm like, what? So I started like sneaking into the donation room when I could and I would bring people in with me or I would pack a bag. There's this lady that I know that's uh, homeless and she's a very generous lady. And I would pack the bag full of clothes because I know she and give it to her because I know she would go hand it out to people. You see donations and money that come to Harvest House are very seldom seen by the people that use the place. Um, I see it going to recovery, constant. I see pictures on the Facebook of things coming in, but when you actually stay at Harvest House, you see none. All these beautiful care packs with Tim cards and shampoos and face cloths and things in them that people donate in a nice little bag all get separated and we get tossed a toothbrush. I've never seen a Tim card. I've never seen these beautiful bags but I always see the people in ministry with wonderful things. There's many occurrences that have donations that come to the Harvest House. I've carried it out to the, to the staff cars. Same with food. Uh, like if you're barred from the place, you're not allowed to eat there. Like you're refused all services. And I mean, the, the things that people get barred for are just minor. If people were doing their jobs, the barring wouldn't have to happen. Out of the cold shelter closed April 1st. And back at the Harvest House, we are. And off the start, I have to say, like it, it wasn't that bad. You know, we got to sleep on the main floor. You were able to go outside and have a smoke. You weren't, you weren't, um, necessarily stuck to the sleeping curfew. You couldn't leave the building, but at least you can go out and back and still have a cigarette in the middle of the night and whatnot. But this one particular night, <laughs> my partner and I was trying to, to put cots up. And my partner and I were just um, in a conversation amongst the two of us, you know, just like couples do every day. And um, they call, it's time to get your cots ready. So we go to the clothing room, grab our cot, you know, pull it out, go to the other room, grab your bedding. And we're still just engaging in our own private conversation. And 
our cots were put up side by side. And my partner got kicked out for the night for it. First, we just both stood there. And then, you know, Chris isn't really one to initiate confrontation. And so he moved his cot to their designated men's area, which was literally a table. So you have the women's cots, you have a, ta a row of tables, and then you have the men's cots. So he might have had to move that cot, I don't know, maybe five feet. So the cot pulls out and it snaps open and his finger got caught. And that's when he goes, ah, oh, fuck, right? And he said it loudly for everybody here. Did they not call the RCMP because he cursed? <laughs> like, really? Anyways, the cot was moved by the time the RCMP got there. RCMP gets there. And pri but prior to the RCMP getting there, I made it very, very clear that they may have whatever kind of rule, but my partner isn't just my partner. My partner is also my caregiver. And your live-in caregiver can be at your side, at your aid, as freely as a service dog. Sorry, hon, I don't want to compare you to a dog, but in this case, your service dog helps you to see across the street or help you, you know, there, there, there's so many uses for, for service dogs these days. Sometimes the dog just goes to the hospital, somebody's sick, and that isn't the companionship of an animal. But that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is the fact that when I voiced my opinion about my federal human rights, I got told this is the Harvest House. We have our own sets of rules, regulations, and policies. And I said, so if I contacted the federal government and I told them about this incident at the Harvest House, they're going to tell you, yes, they're going to tell me, sorry, yes, Miss Camilleri. JP and Mario at the Harvest House are absolutely right. Their rules and reg regulations and policies trump the Charter of Human Rights. Just by me just saying that just now, like, sounds absurd. Again, it just turned in, it was just turning into a screaming match with them. And I just couldn't say enough. Like, you guys are actually in the wrong here. It's not like as if we set up our cots, we crawled into bed and we're sleeping on the same cot. We didn't, you, do you know what I mean? Like, just because you're homeless doesn't mean you, have, you don't have morals and self-respect and some dignity and like, it doesn't mean you're hopeless <laughs> and, and an exhibitionist. I don't know where they were going with this. And it just, and then as my partner's getting his stuff to get ready to go, I made sure he was packing up some of my stuff too. And they're going, no, 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 Shannon, you can stay. And I'm like, oh, no, no, but no, I can't. You just violated my human rights. I'm not going to stick around here for this. What, so you guys can belittle him behind his back? And I'm still fighting with you all night about my human rights. No, I'm good. I'm good. So I left with him that night. And it wasn't shortly after that that I opted to live in a tent than to conform to the Harvest House on any level. Like, uh, for example, somebody would wake up in the morning, all their stuff is missing, which happens frequently. I, I haven't met one person yet that stayed at the Harvest House and got to keep their stuff. So when you wake up, all your stuff's missing, you're not going to be the happiest person in the morning. But as soon as your voice would raise or whatever, they would bar you. So during your barring, you do not get to eat at this place. And one of the cooks there, she's not there anymore. Um, she would make up little boxes of sandwiches and juice boxes and sneak it to me. So I could go feed the people that are outside. Like, and the more I came to know this place, I was like, whoa, even their staff doesn't agree with what's going on here, you know? I've been for uh, 30 days for taking two extra desserts. One for myself and one for Russell Schultz, the father the old man I take care of. But that's the thing, if you go in there and ask for it, they say no. But if you go in there and tell them that you need somebody out there that wants dessert, you still get no. But if you take it, you get bad yourself. Just for helping someone else out.
So, so any food donations that, you know, come in, typically the person who will take care of the food donations is the person who is in, you know, the kitchen. Um, however, any staff member, you know, like can take it on. Um, so there are, uh, there's like a recovery house next door as well. Um, and like it's a man, like addiction recovery. And then the shelter is, you know, like in the main building. So food is distributed based on where the staff thinks it should go. Um, and it's not, it, it's not consistent. Um, you know, quite often I've seen food go bad because people, well, they just ate, well, we'll put this away for another time. But when you have a wedding party that just dropped off food that's been sitting all day, it should be put out and eaten. Um, so, and oftentimes it wouldn't be, it would be put into a fridge and oftentimes it would get thrown out because it wasn't eaten. I went in their fridges and, cause I saw what they were serving and it didn't add up. They never had salad, they never had sides. It was like literally a clump of macaroni or two hot dogs or two slices of cardboard pizza that was left over from Little Caesars the night before, which was meant to be a night snack, but they would serve this as food. Um, but I saw a whole heck a lot of vegetables in there. I saw uh, a lot of lettuce, but there was this one night uh, and I was there during the day while they were preparing it. And I overheard them say to the one volunteer that the cook had said, just cut the gray off. And I look over and it was these steaks and they were, they were spoiled. They cooked uh, Sue actually asked uh, a fella named Danny to come in off the street and serve the steaks. Asked me to cut them up and cut off the, the rotten parts of the meat. And uh, I still didn't think they should have served it, but they did. It was a nice meal, but rotten, outdated food or meat. Same with probably most of the meat that's in the fridge is rotten. I come back the next morning and there's puke all over the outside of the place. People are puking, staff were sick. Whoever ate that steak was sick. They tried to pull it off as there was a flu going around. And I even said out loud, it's kind of funny, whoever ate the steak caught the flu. Um, Jamie Mills' own son was sick for days. For like, for days that kid was sick. Uh, I feel really bad for that kid. Um, yeah, no, it, it was disgusting. Um, I don't know what more to say about that, but the food, it, they did do, like I heard that they caught wind of an inspection, but I saw them cleaning out the fridges and there was stuff in there from 2007. In the middle of July, I was physically standing in front of Harvest House and there had been talk around the community that the health inspectors were coming. Um, and I seen cart, kitchen cart, two level cart, after cart of things being carted out of the Harvest House that nobody has seen for years. I believe out of the back office. I'm not sure where the, exactly they came from, but very clear, 182 High Street. Um, carts and carts going, so I stopped a lady who works at Harvest House and I asked her where these things were going because I noticed they were going right past the recovery house. And she said, we're throwing them in the garbage. And I said, well, why? Well, they're expired. I said, okay, can I look at these cans? And I'm nosy. I'll, I, throw, I call them out on it. They don't like it, but I call them out. And I looked at the expiry dates and they were literally 2006, 2008, 2010. Ironically, when things changed. Um, and I said... It's funny, when I lived in residence with my baby, I asked for some groceries because I was struggling and I was told I had none. There was nothing to give me. These cans are from the year I asked. That's something you have to speak to somebody else about, Amanda, and scurry, scurry, scurry. Questions over. The recovery house would typically get the pick of, of the food that came in. Um, so quite often the, um, you know, what's the word, the good food would go next door and, you know, what was left would, you know, stay at the shelter. Now this didn't happen all the time, but typically that was, that was how it went. I was at the caring kitchen one day and we were just making jokes because they serve either juice, pop or whatever, whatever you want, they'll, they give you at least one glass and I guess I was sitting right near 
the right person because when I was saying about how they kept shipping all their juice, it would go in Harvest House Store as a do donation, just like all the other good food, but then you'd see, 10 minutes later, a full cart of juice, of desserts, of sugar treats, of cookies or whatever, and they'd be shipping them next door to recovery. So the homeless never actually got to see any of this. Email was, must have went out between the time that lunch was finished at Karen Kitchen, which was around 1 o'clock, to the time that I managed to make it to Harvest House to see a few of my buddies, which is like 1.45. And didn't they have non-stop juice all afternoon? Now, that was one freakishly weird day. I'm not saying coincidental, but that was the one day that we saw the juice. After that, it's back to the water and coffee. Now, they have a dessert thing every night at seven o'clock, I think it is, where they serve coffee and desserts. Well, again, if you're a coffee drinker, well, you can skip the long line and get your dessert and go, but it's just, I don't know, any, any, any sugar source or substance that goes in to feed the homeless goes out to feed the recovery house. My partner has this caring heart. So anybody asks him to do something and it's sure if he can do it, he was, he's gonna do it. So the harvest house would ask him to, you know, help them with their food order. And let me also say that that would be the only time that I would be allowed to sit inside the harvest house. Otherwise, I was outside standing on crutches on one leg with everybody else outside. I don't ever look for special treatment, but um, when they close their doors and lock it and you're out there, sometimes you don't even know how long you're gonna be out there. I don't know, just letting you guys know it hurts on one leg, just putting that out there. But Chris would help. So I would, that'd be when I'd be able to sit inside, probably a good thing because I'd watch these food orders come in and I'd see produce, I'd see quality cut meats, I'd see decent snacks and pastries and all sorts of things. And then you'd see those nicely packed boxes all be divided. You know, at first I was like, what, why? Like, why wouldn't you just take it to the fridge, take it to the freezer, done day, everything's put away. Oh no. They, they divide it, they take all the good quality food order and it gets lugged over to the recovery centers. And the balance of what they consider to be shelter food is left for the shelter. And sometimes that's not even enough to even feed those who are there. And um, that, that was never anything that was a big deal at first, but then clients would start commenting like, where are you going with that? right? We're hungry. And, you know, um, it, it would get, it got to the point that it, you know, people would get really angry. Like you're taking that next door, like these guys eat well and, you know, we we're hungry. Right. Um, so it's, I think the waste is the biggest, you know, is the biggest thing. Cause quite often there's no need for waste because you're throwing it out anyway. And these people are homeless they can't get too much food, you know? Um, and again, but again, I, I've seen myself get reprimanded because I would have donations come in and I would put it out if it was subs or sandwiches or something that wasn't going to keep. Um, I would put it out and quite often I'd be, I was drug in the office quite often. Um, and I would be, you know, why did you do that? Because there was already stuff in the fridge and you know, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't know how it is now. It's been months since I've been there, but in my experience when I was there, it was, it wasn't utilized to its best use. That's for sure. That's what happens to the donations. They get hoarded uh, in these carts. For example, jugs of chocolate milk that had soured because they hoarded them so that they didn't have to share with the residents. But the night before everybody got chocolate milk one day, there was at least at least 10 cases, milk crates of chocolate milk brought out and thrown away, sour, because they couldn't put them in the fridge because somebody would see them and they soured. 
They could have handed everybody a jug of chocolate milk at supper that night and been okay. But they can't do that. If there's five packages of ground beef, you divide that into two and a half. Two and a half goes here, two and a half goes there. If that's how you have to make ends meet. But you don't take all five to the recovery and leave the shelter with what? Because I do recall, Cal, being in your lineup for food, I was a resident in your shelter, and I still, there was chicken being served. By the time my partner and I got to the lineup, we had to wait in line for hot dogs to be boiled. Food go into Harvest House, and I've heard the, 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 the people bringing it in for the donations. Well, the expiration date might have been like yesterday or the day before. And hear the stuff, oh, that's okay. I'm sure we'll be able to serve it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I get the fact that there's expiration dates that like a lot of food can go after that. But I mean, when you're serving people that you're supposedly charging $8 a day to stay there, you should be able to at least serve them something that's not past expiration. So I'd stand in this lineup, say maybe 30 people standing there. And I get up, <laughs> ready for supper, right? And I get up, and uh, Belle is the cook, and she's a great cook. So it's finally my turn after waiting all those people, right? And uh, we have three bucks, three dollars. Well, and if you don't have three dollars, Nancy, you can't have supper. If you were working, um even if you were staying in shelter, or if you were coming in, if you're working poor, um, if, if you have your own place, but you don't have money for groceries, there was a time that there was a $3 fee charge for food plates, yes. Well, yeah, a lot of times I'm a bitch when, you know, the food was donated, so, you know, but no, nope, get out of the line up, no supper. Sometimes when uh, I did that, uh, Maybe there was a guy there that had three bucks. So we used to all share. Like, it could be someone else that wanted supper that didn't have three bucks. So we all, you know, tried to make sure everybody had a supper. And that's what they're doing, is basically you have, they got emergency funding from the government. And when they first started taking people in, uh, I want to say uh, April 1st, is when they started doing it after the fire hall closed. They were not only getting $65 a day for each additional person that they housed, but they were turning around and taking $8 a day off of everybody's assistance check, disability check, uh, old age pension, so that by the end of it, the amount of money that they were getting was like $73, up to $75 a day. Someone who is homeless or has been staying in shelter and, and they have got a check, like an assistance check, um, once they get the check, they have to pay $7 a night to stay there. If they're working, they pay $7 a night to stay. Um, they are encouraged to move on. They are encouraged to get a room. There are resources. There's rooming numbers and the staff does try to help them to get a room or an apartment or whatever. And you know, an apartment on 537 a month is not very realistic. Um, so quite often they'll end up staying in shelter and yes, they have to pay $7 a night. I worked a shelter, I took the payments. I actually quite liked Rose when I first started there. Uh, she was very friendly. Um, and then I started to see a different side of her. Uh, she started inviting me to do the walk around, which I thought was pretty cool. They do a walk around uh, to clean up all the garbage. So they go from High Street all the way past to Dominion and then back up St. George. Um, during that cleanup, we would get to the end and, and when we're coming back to the Harvest House and usually there'd be a backpack or clothes and you would tell that it's somebody's, but she would just huck it right into the garbage and I would pull it out and say, like, Rose, this is somebody's backpack. Going around, clean up around the block every morning before service, church service or chapel service, they call it. I clean it up garbage and litter but this one time this got me this is the day I quit cleaning up with her we come up and the office doors are right here and there's a cement pad here there was a perfectly rolled up tent and it had some two by fours sticking out of it Sue walked up and I was right beside her and she went up and kicked it 
I said, like, Rose, um, like, what if somebody was in there? And she goes, ha, 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 good thing there wasn't. And I was like, what? So she orders this one volunteer to throw it out. My friend Jonah had his tent tarp bonded up. She dragged it to the garbage box. She asked me to throw it out. So he picks it all up and he puts it in the dumpster and then Jamie Mills comes running out. No, 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 that's somebody's tent. They have permission for it to be there. And Rose just laughs. Oh, I thought it was garbage. When I found out it was Jonah's tent, I took it out, gave it back to him. I started to see how the way they just throw people's stuff out. And I actually, the one day, they had asked me to throw this one girl's stuff out. She had got a seven day ban for being grouchy. I literally, I was there. She was just being grouchy. If people did their jobs and just talked her through it, it would have been fine. But they threw her out for seven days. And I said, well, can we keep her stuff in the storage room? No, she's on a bar that can go in the garbage. By then I was just starting to lose it. And I took it, I took the bag of stuff and I threw it. And I said, I am so sick of fucking throwing people's stuff out. Um, like there was this perfectly good backpack I got in trouble for. I went looking through and at first their excuse was, Amanda, that's not safe for you. So then I put on their little needle gloves that are worth crap anyway. Um, and I went through the bag. I found a bank card. And Sue goes, well, now we know whose it is. We're going to have to keep it. And I thought, what? So after chapel was done at 10, one of my jobs was to clean up all the stuff. And I would recognize people's stuff because I started to get to know these people right away um, personally. And I started to know whose was whose. And if the camel was, you know, I know who that belongs to. Oh, that sweater, the coloring stuff. I know who the coloring stuff belongs to. Um, and they would pile it all into the lost and found. So by when they come back, the people that were allowed back in at 1230 that had attended Bible study, chapel, or life skills the day before would rummage through the lost and found. So by three o'clock, we got people yelling at each other because you're wearing my sweater, you have my markers, you have my shoes. When I showed up there, I had lots of bags. Um, they signed me in for the first night, but they didn't offer me any storage locker or anywhere to put my belongings. So I had to carry them with me the whole time. And I I'd, I'd found a printer um, in a dumpster that had ink in it that was usable. And I had left it at lunch thinking that it's only gonna be an hour. I, I didn't have any free hands to carry all my stuff. I already had three bags. And I, I figured it would be okay because that's where I was staying. Well, find out that one of the staff decided to take the printer and put it in lost and found when it had only been maybe three, three and a half hours. And one of the other uh, occupants or guests staying at Harvest House took that printer and decided to take it apart. So when I found the gentleman taking my printer apart, I kind of lost it a little. And he told me that Harvest House staff gave it to him. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Harvest House said that it was, uh, it was in the lost and found and that uh, I could have it. I went in and confronted the Harvest House employee with the guy who was taking the printer apart, and he denied everything. The next part, because I started raising my voice a little and saying, if you're going to take my stuff and throw it in the lost and found, who's if what are you going to do with everybody else's stuff and well that kind of started a little bit of an uproar with the rest of the guests in harvest house and randall um another employee of harvest house decided that if i didn't leave that they call the rcmp over them taking my printer like there was just no organization and the one morning i was standing with uh rose cal sue um and Alex was there too, but Alex, he's a cool little character, you know, he doesn't, he, he doesn't agree with much there, but, um, they had said, uh, I, I had asked, I had said, don't you think it's our responsibility to help these people maintain their stuff? 
And they said, absolutely not, Amanda. Laundry, including laundry. So that was another one of my duties. They get a little white bag and you put your laundry in it and you write your name on it. And during that process of, you know, everybody's rummaging to get into their rooms and whatnot, you're handed your laundry bags if you needed laundry done that night and you put your laundry in and staff would write your name on the bag and they would do your laundry during the night and bring it back up to you in the morning. I thought, well, this is great. Yeah, until Trevor, one of the overnight workers, decided that it would be great. Instead of writing Shannon on my laundry bag, he wrote One-Legged Wonder with a red Sharpie. I chuckled a bit because I don't define myself by my disability. So maybe not every day, but quite often, you know, one-legged jokes get told or, you know, hey, Shannon or hey, Pegleg, and I'll laugh with you. I'll joke with you. And I take zero offense. But somebody who's a staff member who's helping people in a shelter during the most vulnerable and exposed times time of your life, like I was, I was, a, I wasn't offended, but I thought it was really awkward. Like you're not even my friend. If my friend came and wrote that, or one of my kids came and wrote that, I'd be laughing all day long. And it wasn't even me that took the greatest offense to it. It was my partner. He's like, I don't even view you that way. So why does somebody else view you that way? So he took great offense. He spent more time letting the individual know that what he thought of him. And then it didn't really stop there. You know, sure, we went to bed that night, but we got up in the morning and there's Trevor again. I'm sitting in a, at a chair outside the men's dorm. There's a table there and it has even a dry erase board that has your daily chores written on it. And I'm just sitting there waiting for Chris to finish doing what he was doing so we can go get on with our day. And Trevor comes up to me and goes, Shane, do you mind if I pray with you? Sure, why not? <laughs> I don't know if I should have said, sure, why not? Um, because then he asked me to take my pant leg out of my pants and he started praying that my leg was going to grow back. Now, that's when I really wanted to laugh. Like, never mind the night before. Like, that's when I really wanted to laugh. I have faith. I believe I'm here by some greater power. Um, however, I've been an amputee for 37 years. I lost my leg to cancer at the age of 11. And just like when I was 11, I know that my leg is never growing back. So I was constantly, you know, hey, you know, so-and-so, your stuff's on the wash, on the way to the dryer, and your stuff is about to come out of the dryer. And, you know, it was organization, letting people know where their stuff was at. Um, and then I would come back on the weekend, and from the weekend, and on the Monday, and people would be like, man, I wish you were here doing laundry on the weekend. I lost all my clothes, you know, staff did laundry last night. I can't find anything. Uh, people were constantly missing their clothing from the laundry room. Um, I feel like we could add way better organization and a bed that could have been kept a lot better. I don't see any reason for people's stuff to go missing when it's in the hands of staff. Um, I don't know. And then, and then another thing that caused chaos is people would steal from each other in the night. All of my belongings I had sat down in a chair and I was very exhausted. So I put my bags underneath my feet and my purse was on my shoulder. When I woke up, everything was gone. Um, that was my first day being at night, being at the Harvest House. So then they wake up and they're kind of in a fuss. They're grouchy, they say, what's wrong? Um, you know, all my stuff was stolen. They would ask to check the cameras, but they were told, no, you have to call the RCMP in order to look at the cameras. Knowing that this population, the majority of this population is not going to call the RCMP to look at camera footage. They don't want to bring the RCMP to the Harvest House. And, you know, I, I understand that. So the rules when I was there in April of 2019, um, 
they frequently changed, but this one was set. You had to attend chapel at 9 a.m., at 4 p.m., or the life skills study at 6, which the life skills studies was basically Bible study, uh, in order to get back in the next day for 12.30. Um, if you did not attend the Bible study, it doesn't matter the weather, it doesn't matter anything, you're out. Um, to me, that really kind of threw me off because when we're helping people, like we're supposed to be helping the people, not building our own agenda. They were a shelter that they kick you out at nine o'clock in the morning after breakfast is done. They tell you you can't go back until 12, 31 o'clock. And then they change the rule to, well, unless you stayed with us the night before, you can't come in at all in the afternoon. So, but here's the thing. There was people going in those doors between 9 and 12.30, and then again from 1 to 5. Anytime they were closed to the homeless people, they were open to everybody else. Like, I don't know who all these people were that were going in and out of there, but they were always going in empty-handed and always coming out with stuff. Didn't have to be little church-going ladies. It could have been anybody or a bunch of men going in there in the afternoon, having a meeting and then leaving, saying that they were doing something in the chapel. But that's the thing, like, you don't, like, and I, I mean, it's none of my business what's going on with Harvest House. I mean, they obviously have a business to run. They obviously are running a very successful business with all of these new locations opening up. Every day they have a Bible study at 9 a.m. and at 4 p.m. And if you do not sit in the Bible study, you have to leave the building. Rain or, rain or snow or shine, yes. And if you're sick and you don't feel good, don't matter. You're out the door. So you can sit in the bike racks or on the ground. But lately, <laughs> Harvest House has become so cold that the one concrete slab that they had that had some shelter from the rain, they fenced off. So now it's almost as if they're trying to like establish some sort of compound here where, well, if we're not open, we don't want you out front. Because they will call nine. They will call the RCMP to have you removed because you're loitering. You're a homeless shelter. Where are they supposed to go? Where am I supposed to go? So, I, like, if it starts raining, you might have a little bit of a lip if the pigeons don't poop on you. But like, there's nowhere. You got to go somewhere else. So, Cal, who thinks that, well, we have an early curfew of 9 p.m. because it keeps them from committing crimes overnight. Well, you know what? You, all you're doing is you're kicking them all out anyways, putting them all over the city because they got nowhere else to go. You're the shelter. You should be at least accountable or want to help because that's the Christian thing to do. Well, they're running it like a business. If we're closed, go away. You know, like the worst, the worst of it was like, this is such, this is like, they put their claim to fame that they help people and they're so loving and they're so compassionate. Yet most of my days I was sitting at a table by myself watching the people outside behind a locked door. The people we were supposed to be helping are curled up in like bike racks. They're, they're passed right out in, in the front of the place. They're wandering aimlessly down the street. Like there is no help. You know, I thought a lot when asked to do this video and my initial response was fear because I loved this community and I know, and I know what this is and I know what this means. Doing this interview could potentially cost me my diploma from what I earned in school um, for speaking out. Um, I battled with that um, when I was done school because I was warned about it. But in all honesty, I think the cost is worth, is worth this because these people are worth it. These people are amazing. It's a shame that it has to be a place that profits and 
doesn't even <laughs> doesn't even respect the human nature and I I don't know it's just, it's, it's just disappointing when I, whenever I hear Harvest House it's almost as if it's like <laughs> you go in there and they harvest all the good out of you and leave you with nothing but emptiness. The be Harvest House leadership is time to change. It, it can't be the way it is because people are going to start just not even bothering to go and listen or care what they have to say. And it can be dangerous for some people. And I don't see anything bad happen to anybody there. But leadership has to change. Because it's not the way you, it needs to go back to the way it used to be because it's not at all the same. And people are, are leaving and freezing at night because they'd rather sleep in a tent than sleep at the house. It's not right. The, the staff of the Harvest House, you guys need your recovery program more than those that are in your re recovery program. Because you guys haven't even owned your own faults. And even as, even as of today, like there's comments and there's emails and, and texts and phone calls going out and there's no onus, there's no ownership. But when you guys do your recovery, you guys are in church, you guys talk about owning it so you can become one with God, right? When are you becoming one with God? When are you taking off your mask so God can actually see these people? When, is, when are you guys taking off your masks as a group so God can see what the Harvest House is truly about? I wouldn't be surprised if those masks are so embedded that they'll never come off. There's probably a good reason for that. Because while you guys are trying to promote recovery, you guys aren't even truly recovered yourself. And I don't say that to be disrespectful, but they all, they, you know, if, if you, love starts within before you can ever love somebody else. Helping yourself, come, helping others comes right after it. I don't know, you guys might want to try your recovery program, see how it works. If I could say one thing to leadership at Harvest House, it'd be what happened. I've asked many, many times before, for the last two summers straight, what happened to this place? I think it's our right to know what happened. Because when it first opened, it was our house. We'd say, whose house? Our house. Because God was there. But when did it go from our house to theirs? And when's the harvest coming back? When is it coming back? Because <laughs> I'd really, I'd really like to see it again. I'd love to see it do what it's supposed to. Yeah. Anyone watching this documentary, anybody who is watching it, whatever your motives are, Listen to your heart, trust your gut. Our gut never steers us wrong. One of the big issues from my experience in not just this community, but other communities can have it as well, is the desire to defend and the desire to not believe and the desire to knock down and say that the motives for this documentary are wrong. But the fact is, this isn't about the staff, this isn't about the organization, this is about the people, the people that need to be helped, that need to be loved, that when they have wet feet, deserve a pair of socks, that if they are hungry, deserve a plate of food, because that is what we're supposed to do. And if you can't do it, stop doing it and do something else. <laughs>
you know, like, Cal, it's a mess here. And he had said, I know, Amanda, I've let the devil into God's house, and now it's time to clean out the filth. 